With all the craziness going on in our world, does it feel like the perfect storm is brewing? What are you going to do about it? Hey, Prophet and Preppers, I'm Jonathan. And I'm Kyleen. And today we have an opportunity to interview Jim Phillips again, who is a leading expert in all things preparedness. And one of the things that Jim is talking about is um, the storm. There is this incredible storm. We can see it on the horizon and it is rolling in. And sometimes it can be a little bit scary. And, and do we know what to do about it? Well, today, Jim's gonna share with us nine areas of focus that you're really gonna wanna think about. Hey, Provident Preppers, we are excited to be with you today and we are so excited to have Jim Phillips with us talking about important preparedness matters. Now, let me introduce Jim a little bit. For those of you who haven't seen some of our previous videos with Jim, Jim has been teaching self-reliance and preparedness and resilience since I was in junior high. And not to get into ages or anything, but that's a long, long time ago. Jim has been doing this for a very long time. He lives it. He teaches it. He breathes it. This is something that is such a part of him. He is such an important asset to us and to so many. He has taught thousands and thousands and thousands and blessed lives. So, uh, Jim, welcome and thank you for being with us. Well, it's my pleasure to be here again. I appreciate what you folks are doing also. You you know, when you listen to different people, it simulates some thoughts because it's like there's a whole bunch of things I haven't thought of yet, but I keep trying to to uncover what it is that I don't know because that's the thing you have to understand is it's what you don't know that's going to get you in trouble. It's what you don't know that will kill you. And so uh, I'm trying to discover what is it that I don't know and how do I figure out what it is that I don't know when I don't know what I don't know. That's right. And that's this is all part of this process that we're in. And uh, and speaking of that, um, I saw one of your videos recently, and, and you and I have talked just a little bit about this, about analogy that you put forward that I thought was very effective and, and really describes the time that we live in. And, and I'm going to leave that to you. So will you tell us about that analogy and, and what it means to you? Well, the analogy is about, I sometimes I use the word, the perfect storm. And it's about looking at the horizon to see what may be coming. The only reason we look on the horizon to see what the weather is or look at the forecast is, so we might know what kind of, you know, umbrella to take or kind of a coat or hat to take or maybe not to go outside. So we want to look ahead and see what it is we may face. And so that's what I'm trying to do in looking around. Now, you can spend all of your time on the internet and reading every blog you can find and all the YouTubes about all the bad things that, that might happen. And they're out there. I don't spend a lot of time doing that because uh, once you figure out that there's stuff coming, it's like, well, what I need to do is protect myself. And so that's what I recommend that people do. But the analogy is you look to the west and you see these dark clouds. Our weather comes from the west. You see these dark clouds on the horizon. There's lightning and thunder and everything. And you can kind of hear the wind in the distance. It's like, well, this is going to hit. It probably isn't going to miss. Maybe it will, but it probably won't. So when you take a look at the things that are going on around the world and in this country, then you go like, well, I'm, you know, you can say, I hope this is going to miss, but you can't live on the hope because if you're wrong, you're in trouble. So what you have to do is admit that uh, the, the conditions are serious. There's enough different kinds of things with economy, supply chain difficulties, with uh, war that's going on in different places, disruption of pipelines, uh, disruption of power. And then you understand what other people can do that would want to do these things to disrupt our life here, shut down our power, shut down our, our uh, supply of energy and things like that. And you go like, OK, any one of these things would be bad, but there could be two or three of them hit. And that makes it the perfect storm, just like that movie and that book. You know, these things all combine. Now it's really bad. Any one of them, we might be able to, to ride through pretty easily, but it's like two or three of these things hit, it's going to be really bad. Not that I'm into gloom and doom. Uh, the kind of the way I describe myself and my thinking is that there's no doubt that tomorrow will come and there's no dispute that things happen, but how you are prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you're prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. 
And I believe it's good to think in terms of adventure rather than, oh, my heck, this is going to be terrible survival. And it's going to be suffering and pain and death. And you get ground up in that, you get paralyzed. And so I want to look forward and make it an adventure because I'm getting ready to deal with things. So that's what I encourage people to do. Uh, some people say, well, this stuff can't happen. Well, then you have to be right. You cannot be wrong if that's what your belief is. So I'd rather take the, not the negative, not the gloom and doom side, but say, if it's possible, if it's probable, I need to be ready to deal with it. Otherwise, I'll be in deep trouble. Okay, but, but uh, you know, so far, we've had a few clouds go over, right? Um, some sunshiny skies. Um, tell us what you're seeing. I mean, I... We've had some pretty good times, right? Yeah, we, we've had great times, wonderful times. But if you take a look at the uh, the history of countries, you take a look at the history of the world, of uh, different groups, there has always, you cannot find one case where it, uh, over a period of years, maybe it's 15, 20, 100, 150 years, take a look at, you know, back, uh, well, 100 years ago, uh, approximately, we had uh, the Great Depression. We had World War One, World War Two. Very devastating to a lot of people. Take a look at the uh, the revolutions that have been around the world in France and in Germany, different places in England. Uh, there have been economic collapses before, and so it, it's looking at the past and kind of how we, as I'll say, humans behave uh, sometimes um, not very well and how we get ground up in, in emotions and in fear, and that causes us to do things that compound. And then once people are in fear, and once they're in, 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 in rage, this is what happens when people become angry because they're afraid of things, and then they become enraged, they do really, really stupid things is what it comes down to, uh, really harmful things. And so just looking at history, and trying to say that, well, we're so knowledgeable, sophisticated, all the, we won't do those things again. Yeah, you bet. I don't mean to be cynical, but I, I, can't, I can't count on that because if I'm wrong, if you're wrong about, well, nothing's going to happen and I, have, I just have hope it won't happen. Hope will not save your hiney when it gets bad. The way that you have hope is you make preparations for the, the future. You pay, make preparations for the worst of events. And then if they do occur, you'll be okay. If they don't occur, well, you were, you were wrong, but uh, you, know, you didn't have the fear in the process. And I believe this is about being able to face the future with hope and with confidence. And you can only do that by recognizing what the reality is and then making provisions for that reality so that, well, it won't be all that bad. It'll be bad, but it won't be all that bad. And you can get through it. Okay, so we see this storm coming on the horizon, right? And it looks like it could be really intense. So what are 10 actionable items that you could recommend to our viewers so that they can be better prepared to weather that storm? Well, what you need is an organized structure and a way of thinking because you can't just have, for me, I can't just have a checklist. I'm an engineer by training and background, and I like to look at systems and how things fit together, how they, how they interrelate. And for myself, what I did, I broke it down into nine areas. Uh, but within these nine areas, of course, they break down into further things. So maybe I'll start there because this allows me to remember, keep in mind, have I covered all of that area? Now, by the way, you will never be perfectly, absolutely prepared for whatever may happen. So one definition you need to understand is about a survivor or survivability. It's about adaptability. You have to be able to adapt. Because you're going to get surprised. No matter what happens, no matter what I've prepared for, there's going to be something come at me. It's like, wow, I didn't see that coming, or I didn't see it coming that way, or I didn't know it would be quite that bad. But you have to be able to adapt to it. And the way that you adapt to things is you have an understanding about how and why things work. You understand what the issues are, uh, what the strengths that you have are, what your deficiencies are, so you can be plugging those deficiencies. So that's why I'm always trying to analyze. One of the things I'm doing is I'm asking myself, what if? When I travel to another city, I ask, like, what if there was EMP right now, everything shut down and my car doesn't run? I'm like, okay. Now that makes me ask, what is it that I have in the trunk of my car in the back seat that would allow me to keep going? Have I made provisions for at least something? So I'm asking what if all the time because I'm looking for what it is I don't know, I don't understand. 
So anyway, back to this idea of these nine areas. And they're, they start out in order of priority of what's going to get you in trouble first and the worst. And so let me, I'll give you the nine areas, and then we'll go through them real quickly. First off, I call the one foundation, then it's clothing, then water, then sanitation, then nutrition, then shelter, wellness, tools, and supplies. I'll, I'll go back to that list there. So the first one, I call it foundation. It's like, well, that's a weird word. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like, you know, water. We understand what that is. But here's what foundation is. Foundation is very much about um, well, what I call the law of provident living, which is about your, your spiritual foundation, your attitude, your knowledge is in that, and then also about having stuff. But it's about attitude that's one of the most critical things in there. Because when you find yourself in an unfamiliar, in a scary situation, what is your attitude? What is your outlook to those things? If you immediately trigger into fear, then you have a problem because you cannot function very well. When we're afraid, we don't function very well. Now, you may be startled and you may go like, what the heck? And then it's like, oh, okay, all right. So you, you, you analyze what's going on around you and then you want to get a grip on yourself. But it's your attitude that's so critically important. So in the foundation, it's about your outlook, your attitude. It's about your spiritual foundation. And the way I define spiritual foundation is there's more to you than meets the eye more depth of character, capacity, energy, hope, future, than is just this physical body that you, you're inside of. Now, you can identify that however you want to, and, and, and however you fulfill that. For me, I just simply say, well, I'm a Christian, and that's where I focus my life spiritually on that and learning all the things I can about a Christian life and what that means. So if I have that foundation, then I have a, a purpose, a feeling about who I am, where I'm going to. Then you come to attitude, and it's like, how do, you, how do you have an attitude? We're not talking just about positive mental attitude. We're talking about an attitude down inside of you that says, so long as I have breath, I'm filled with joy. Because that means I can, I can respond, I can react, I can do things, I can make things happen, I can help. But how do you develop attitude like that? This is the problem I had when I first kind of discovered this law and wrote it. It was spiritual attitude, knowledge, and then stuff. And I recognize that, well, spiritual has to be first. And it's like attitude is critical because you lose your attitude, you lose your life. How do you develop attitude? It's actually number three on this list, which is knowledge. When you have an understanding about how and why things work, when you understand your physiology or physical needs, as well as how things work in the world, then you can start learning about those things. Now, I could, we could spend the next hour just on that topic. I just want to identify that in foundation, it's about your attitude, your outlook, and how you're going to be responding to things. And it's critical that you learn to not react. Because when you react, it's like the, you know, tap the hammer with the, or tap your knee with the rubber hammer, your knee kicks. You didn't have any control. When you're reacting, you're out of control. So you have to learn. And the key word is to learn how to respond. So you start looking around all the situations. How would I respond so that I'm not reacting? Okay. So you're going to be reading books, listening to people, learning how the mind works, how you're wired, and then learning to respond to things differently. That's a whole series of things. And so I have a bunch of books. I say, you need these books. So they're not optional. If you really want to make it through tough times, you have to have these books and study them. And there are no physical survival skills about how to build a fire in them. They're all about your head, your heart. Okay, number two. On the list, and as clothing, it's like, why clothing? Now, these nine are actually somewhat dynamic because it depends on the, the conditions that you're around. I put, for us that live in the temperate zone, clothing is very important because if you are stranded outdoors in the middle of a blizzard uh, and, you know, you're just out there, it's your clothing that is your personal portable shelter. Now, this is also true if you're in extreme heat. You know, if I've spent time down in Arizona and in very hot climates and camping and, and living in those things, it's your clothing that is your first protection from that heat, from that sun. Different clothing than the cold. Uh, by the, before I was, uh, well, yeah, before I was 20 years old, I'd been above the Arctic Circle, uh, living up there for two weeks with my father, unsupported. We were living out of our backpack off of Point Barrow, Alaska, the, the highest temperature we saw was 10 below zero, and the lowest was 30 below zero. But we'd already been colder than that in the Rocky Mountains at 40 and 50 below zero. So this was no big deal, in a way, if you're prepared to deal with it. And it was all about our clothing, every bit about our clothing, because we can do that with no shelter and no fire. 
So anyway, when the conditions are really bad, it's clothing that's going to protect you first. So you have to have that in place for whatever condition you may find yourself in. So you can start asking the question, if I'm stuck outside and I have nothing but just what I'm wearing, would I be okay? I'm not. Oh, okay. I need to fix that. So you learn how to fix that. You start digging into that. Number three on the list is water. And when I say water, it means, well, water itself, but it's everything about water. It's what you put water in, how you carry water, how you take it along with you. It's how you take bad water and make it safe to drink. It's how you find more water and all the ways you can do that. So what you do is ask questions about where, I'm, where I am right now, if the water was shut off, what would I do? Do I have water around me that I can get at and use? Is it expedient water? I can just use it right now because I'm getting thirsty. And what you have to understand Without adequate water, you can die very quickly. We, most of us understand that in the heat, when we're perspiring and working, we're going to we need a lot of water. Uh, you know, you can sp perspire away a half a gallon to a gallon of water in a day when you're working in the extreme heat. I've worked at, at 115 to 120 above zero, and boy, that's hard on you, and you need a lot of water. But what a lot of people don't understand, and this is one of my, my specialty areas, is cold weather and winter, you dehydrate very rapidly in the cold. You, at, at 10 below zero, you dehydrate as fast as you would at 100 above zero if you're outside working. And most people don't understand that. So water is very critical because you can die within hours if you, of dehydration if you don't have adequate water. And I, I cite the example one time I was down in uh, Phoenix. I'd been working down there. And I read in the, the news report that there was a family that had driven down a dirt road. Their car broke down, it, you know, the heat had overheated or something. And they decided to walk back to the freeway. It was probably only five miles or something like that back to the freeway. So it was only five miles. Now, that day, it was over 110 degrees in Phoenix. And it may have been 110, 20, 15, 16 degrees out where they were. And they decided to walk back. Now, two things they had wrong. One, they didn't have the clothing to do that. They didn't have what they needed to be outside in the sun. If they were going to walk back, they shouldn't have done that. Stay where you are in the shade. But then they didn't have water. And it's water that ultimately got them. When their bodies were found, they knew what time kind of they had left and when the car had broken down. And within in less than eight hours, they had died. And so they speculated some of those people already expired within four hours of when they started walking back. Water would have extended their time and clothing would have helped. So you see how those are so critical to be up the top of the list. Attitude, because you lose your attitude and say, I don't know what to do. I guess I'll die. Well, you, uh, yeah, you'll fulfill that you know, prophecy. Now then it gets to the next thing and you go like, well, where's food in this? Well, food's not yet. We're sanitation. Sanitation, because in an emergency when things shut down, if you start the disease cycle within hours, if you've mishandled things around you, whether it be human waste or spoiled food or something that died around you, you can start the disease cycle. It may be two or three days before you're actually sick, but you have already launched into it. And now you can't stop it because it's so much easier to stay well when, you, when you know, conditions are bad than try to get well once you're sick because you can't take care of yourself very well. So that's why it's number four. And that one's always going to be very high on the list, even if even if you're in an area where the weather is mild and you, the clothing isn't an issue and you have lots of water around you. And even if you have food, you get a cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and there's no medical help, then you can die very quickly. Cholera is 60 percent fatal untreated. It's easy to treat. But if you don't treat or don't, don't know what to do and you've got cholera, then you've got less than a 50-50 chance you'll live through it. That's not good odds. So sanitation is very high on the list. You take a look around. Well, how, how can I keep my area clean? What can I do? What about this human waste stuff? That's how we spread so much of our disease. How can I protect myself from things that may be contaminated or things in the air? So sanitation, all the sanitation issues, that's become one of my specialties is talking about sanitation and publishing on that. Now we finally get the food. We think of food because we get hungry, you know, three or four times a day, we want something to eat. We don't think about water because water's all around us. We just go get a drink or something to drink. So it's not even, we don't even think about it, but our stomach starts growling on us and we go like, oh, food. So people want to store food. Good idea. But how long, do, if you have the other things taken care of, all those first four things how long will it take you to starve to death? Uh, 
two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, longer than that, if you've got adequate water, the conditions are mild, you can live six weeks before you'll die. Now, you'll be in bad shape, okay? Not saying you'll be in good shape. I fasted one time. I, I tried 10 days, then I went 14 days, then I did 20 days. I had plenty of food. I had electrolytes. Uh, I wasn't under stress, and I could fast just fine, not eat anything during that period of time. Now, my energy level finally fell after a few days. Actually, my energy level didn't really go down until I got to about 10 days, and then I noticed that I didn't quite have the strength and the stamina. But my body had shifted over into another node and had plenty of water and I wasn't under stress. You can go a long time without food. I do use the word nutrition versus food because a vast majority of the things that people are eating now have nothing to do with nutrition. They're very harmful to your health. And we could spend an hour in that area there just saying you should not be eating or storing these things because they weaken your body. Anyway, nutrition you need to take care of. Now we get down to this thing, well, shelter. Why is that so far down on the list? Well, if you have water, you, well, if you have the attitude, you have the water that you need, you have the clothing that you need, and, and you have the, the nutrition that's taken care of, then what do you need shelter for? The clothing will take care of you. The nutrition will take care of you. And so shelter comes lower on the list. Now, shelter becomes very important, and you may jump it up there in certain conditions. If I don't have the clothing, I need shelter. Uh, if I, if I don't, can't take care of myself that way, or if somebody is, is injured and they need, or sick and you need to help them, then doing that out in the environment at below zero is going to be much more difficult than having a space to get into. It may not be really warm, but you're out of the wind and the snow and the blizzard. So shelter is very, very important when conditions warrant it. But if everything else is right, no fire, no shelter, 40 below zero. I've done that. I teach people to do that. You can do that too, but you have to do it right. And the clothing was right, and the nutrition was right, the water was right, the attitude was right. So shelter was like, I, it's really, it'd be convenient, but you don't have to have it. Now, if you need to undress to change your clothing or fix them, well, shelter becomes important when it's below zero. Uh, I've tried that. All right, so now you see where shelter fits in that. Now we come to another one that's kind of a catch-all, and this actually has a lot of categories in it, and this is wellness. Now, wellness is kind of the catch-all of everything outside of that. We could say, well, wellness is, this all is about wellness. Water is about wellness. Clothing is about wellness. But it's like all the other things in this. Well, it is first aid. It is about, well, it may be medications for somebody who needs that. It may be what substitutes you have when you don't have the medications, the herbs, the essential oils, all these things. How do I find medicinal plants? Those, that all comes in play in there. Another one that people don't think about so much is, and that is communication. We are our cultural community, uh, individuals, and we like to understand what's going on around us. We want to hear. We want to know. We want to understand because uncertainty makes us, um, well, it can be frightening to be uncertain. So inbound communication becomes very, very important. So that's where the radio, a listening device, is an important tool because I want to hear what's going on around me. That also means, well, now we may need electricity, batteries. So you see these things start tying together when you go down this understanding of the priority of what I need is you can be asking the questions. I don't have to teach you these things. Nobody else has to teach you if you really get into thinking, what is it that I need? Now, if you don't have a lot of experience dealing with emergencies and survival, then it's very useful to have somebody pointing the way, somebody that's instructing, somebody that's like the things you do on your, your, the Provident Prepper, the things you're giving, because you're giving people all kinds of ideas. You do these multiple short programs. Some people watch that and say, well, I understand that, so I don't need to watch that. You look at some other things and go like, wow, never thought about that. Where does that fit in my nine? In my case, I ask myself that question. So that's why I like to listen to other people because I ask, well, gee whiz, hadn't thought about that. How critical is that for me? Some things may not be critical for me because of where I live, but for somebody else, it may be vital for their survival. Uh, there's another one that comes into play in this we don't like to talk about or think about, and that is, and this is in the wellness area, this is about personally family household protection. When there's bad people around you, and here's one of the things you need to understand is desperate people do desperate things. When they are desperate about things and they're frightened 
And by the way, let me give you the definition of fear. One word definition, some of these principles I teach, because this is useful for you so you can figure out, is, is there something I need to learn? When you discover something that causes you fear, that's the clue. You see, the best definition that I know of one word definition of fear is ignorance. If you're afraid of something, it means you don't know what to do about it. You don't know what the problem is. You don't know the solution. So fear is ignorance. So that's one of the ways you can say, oh, I, there's something I don't know. In fact, I don't even know what it is I don't know, but I'm afraid. Okay, now you, at least you know where to go to solve those things. So desperate people do desperate things because they don't know what to do. They're in pain. They're, they're, they're in rage. And when they hit rage, you know, you, you look at people that do really bad things. You go, how can they do that in this domestic situation? Well, they went from fear to anger to rage. And when you're in rage, you are out of control. And people do things they would never even consider doing. Well, when there's people around you raging about the circumstances because they did not make preparations, you may have to be ready to defend yourself somehow. Now, it's best to not be around those people, but if you're going to be around them, you need to know what to do. So that's another thing that comes in this area of staying well, is to be able to protect yourself. All right. Now then we get down to the last two, which are actually scattered through all the other areas. That is tools. Tools are, well, you, well, I mentioned radio. That's actually a tool for communication to listen. A short wave that you can broadcast out, that's a tool. But let me get more fundamental than that. Fire is a tool. Fire is a tool that allows you to cook, to sanitize things, to boil water, things like that. So fire is a tool. Well, then I need tools to start fire. Some of these tools, flint and steel, a, fire, a, a magnesium fire starter, something like that. Those are all tools to help you start a fire. But how about a match? Now, a match is a supply that you can strike and start a fire. So you see how these all tie together in here. We have tools and supplies scattered throughout. Obviously, water is a supply. Obviously, water purification tablets or iodine or chlorine is, is a tool, is a supply that gives me the ability to, to purify water. So you start looking at this whole thing. And if you would, I'll say, look on those nine, if you wanted to, to do it that way, and you say, what is it that I don't know in this area? What might I face? So you don't necessarily have to have a checklist. People ask me for a list to say, well, what is it I need to get? I won't give you one because my situation is different than yours. But what I'll give you is here's the principle of where you look. And then we can talk about things because you may not understand how to take really bad water. I mean, garbage water, sewer water and make it. Maybe you don't understand the process. And but you if you get the principles of what to do and I teach about the principles, then you come right down to here the fine little things that I need to have that I can do that. And one thing you need to understand is my definition of knowledge. When we mention knowledge in this law of provident living, knowledge is not having a information about something. A this this little class we're doing, there's no knowledge in it. No, zero knowledge. This is only information. All those books on my wall behind the uh, my back there, there, there's only information. There's no knowledge in them. There's no knowledge in the library. There's no knowledge on the internet. There's only information on the internet. What you do to turn it into knowledge, you go get experience with it. So you get down the book, you read the book, you highlight the book, and go, that's a good idea. I wonder if that works. Now, sometimes in some of these classes that people give and some of the stuff on the, on the YouTube, some of those things are, they're not necessarily wrong, but they're incomplete. Because they gave you a recipe, what you need is you need this supply, and you use it this way to accomplish this end. They gave you a recipe. What if you don't have the ingredients? What are you going to do? You're like, I, I don't know what to do. I don't have the right. It's like, like a cookbook. Anybody can cook from a cookbook. You can get out the cookbook, go to the shelf, get all the ingredients, don't have one of the ingredients, go to the store and buy it. Now you have the ingredients. Now follow the instructions. You can now cook. That's a cook. But a chef is somebody that can go to an unfamiliar kitchen, open all the cabinets. You remember the, uh, the cooking shows. They do that. So the mystery ingredients, they give them weird stuff. Now, but they got this kitchen full of stuff, and that chef will make a good meal out of it because he understands the principles of what things go together, what flavors work together. And so now he can create it. So what you really want to do is understand the principles involved, and that's why I try to take everything down to principle. Now, you wound me up, and you turned me loose. I apologize <laughs> for the 
for the diatribe, if that's what it is, but just to just to say this is how I think and how I try to teach people in the classes, in the, the videos I do, is understand the principles, not a recipe. You can start out with a recipe to learn how to cook, but once you learn how to cook, you need to learn how to become a chef that can deal with whatever you find and turn it into a meal. That's what my focus is, how to make the how to make preparedness work because you understand not because you have the recipe that you can read, because if you don't have some of the ingredients or it's a different situation than you've been told, you need to understand principles. So that's why I try to dig into things, understand and teach that way. Oh, that God. was that was awesome, Jim. We appreciate that. And that's a great way to look at it. So now we have um, before we end here, we have newbie preppers out there people who this is this is just brand new to them we've we've also got people that are absolute experts but for for your newbie prepper what is the one thing that you can leave with them we see this storm on the horizon we're really concerned about what's coming what is the one piece of expert grandfatherly advice that you could give to them Okay, and I get asked that question periodically. In fact, last night in the class I was teaching live, I was asked that a similar question. He asked, well, "Is there is there a video or a movie that I could watch that would cover these things?" And I said, "No, there isn't. There is there's not a book that would do it." Well, what he was asking is, "What I want to do is I want to see somebody go through all of the the things they may go through on how they solve the problem." And look, there's a thousand, ten thousand videos on YouTube that take up any of those little pieces. You don't have time to watch them all and figure out which ones apply to you and which ones are junk and those things. So here's how I would answer that. The best way that I know to answer, there's one book, and this is a book that I use in one of my classes, and this is, this is the attitude book, the most important book that you can own that has no survival skills in it whatsoever that are physical survival skills. It is a book called Deep Survival by Lawrence Gonzalez. Now, if somebody, if you didn't understand why I give that to, somebody might get that book and say, how's that going to teach me to survive? That, I'm, that's not telling me how to, how to find water. That didn't tell me how to build a fire. That didn't tell me any of those things. You don't need to know any of those things until you've decided that you're going to survive. Until you decide that you're going to survive no matter what, but I need to make provisions to do that. So that book will help you do that. Actually, there are three books. You asked for one, so I'm going to tell you three books that I tell people to get and why they get those things. And I've done this for years, uh, many years. The three most important books, number one, Deep Survival. You get that first, you read that book. Now, stick with it because the first part of it's a little bit cerebral because it's going to tell you how your brain is wired and why it is that you freeze or run or why you're at. You need to understand that so you can say, that's why I reacted that way. Now I can fix it because I understand what to do. Very important. Uh, okay. The second book is called Miracle in the Andes. Miracle in the Andes by Nando Parado. Now, you read them in this order. And you do it because once you've gone through deep survival, I hope you go through deep survival a couple of, I go through it at least once or twice a year. I listen to it as audio now because I'm, I don't have time to sit down and read as much as I'd like to. But when you go through that book and you start to understand that book, deep survival, when you get to miracle in the Andes, here is an impossible situation. None of those people should have survived. Many of them didn't. But you can also see in that book, here's a subtitle to deep survival, it, who lives, who dies, and why. That's why I bought the book, because I looked at it, and the cover didn't impress me. I thought, another mountain climbing book about a guy that survived something horrible. No, it's the most important book you can own when it comes to survival. Who lives, who dies, and why? What will start happening is you're going through a miracle in the Andes. You'll, see, you'll start to see somebody like, I don't think they're going to make it. They don't have the attitude. They don't have the will. They don't have the tenacity to, to survive. You'll see other people that are like, this guy doesn't know anything about survival, but I think he might make it because he's got the, the survivor's attitude. He has the he has kind of something internal within him. Then you get, and so you start to see that. Then the other book you get is called The Raft. It's a classic written in 1942. And it's about three guys in a raft in the Pacific Ocean that, that went down 
and they float around in this raft. They had nothing. Zero. And so part of the message is, and you have to understand, there's people that are in terrible, impossible situations. They survive. Then you have people that, ha that, that have nothing and don't really have any skills, but they survive. So you start asking the question, why? It's impossible. If those people can survive, and by the way, there's hundreds of them that have survived impossible situations, you start asking, what's the common thread that got them through? It was their head and their heart and they adapted to the situation. And they had the will to do what it took. Uh, I, I, I teach a class called Surviving the Impossible. And by the way, those three books are a critical part of it and some others that are in there, but it's helping to understand how it works and how you can train yourself to be ready to properly respond to a really bad situation that right now might look to you like being impossible. There's things, you know, 50, well, let's see, as old as I am, I could say uh, 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 60 years ago, there are situations that would have been impossible to this 15-year-old kid. I would say, I can't survive that. I look at them now and say, wow, well, piece of cake, nothing to it, because I have an understanding. So you can learn the skill of attitude and survival. So if somebody's brand new, I, I know the tendency is, what's the stuff? Give me the list. I need to know the stuff to go buy. Tell me what to buy. I, I won't give that to you because if I just give you a list of what to buy when things get really tough, you'll probably just give up and die. You've got to change the inner terrain, the attitude, the spiritual, the attitude, the knowledge. That's what you need to fix while you're doing the other things, and you'll get better and better at having the stuff, learning the skills, storing the things so that you can make it no matter what. So a newbie right now, you're better off than when I was when I was a newbie because I didn't have a clue where to begin. I stumbled around through all kinds of things for decades to arrive at where I am, where I can say with confidence these things and know it and teach it because I know it. I understand it because I have the, I have the history behind me. So that's what I do to the newbie. Get those books and then ask lots of questions of people who have been doing things and teaching things, but always ask the question. And these people, me, even me, look at me, I'll say not cynically exactly, but with a, a doubt that says, is that really the whole story? I, is that enough? Did he tell me enough? Does he understand how and why things work? Because you don't know until you understand how and why it works in every situation, not just in when conditions are a certain way in every situation. That's why I'm not done yet, because there's some situations I have not gotten myself into, and I'm not quite sure what to do. But I can probably extrapolate something that will at least give me hope and confidence that I have a chance, rather than, I don't know what to do. I guess I'm going to die. By the way, came upon somebody in the wilderness in a, in a blizzard. It was leaning up against a tree and looked. He, he was wearing what I call the wet cat look. You ever seen a cat caught outside and wet? Everything's kind of dripping and sagging, and they just they look awful. This guy had on a, a wet cat look, and he looked up. I wear on snowshoes going through this blizzard, and he looks up, and he says, I, uh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I guess I'm going to die. Well, if, if we weren't there, he would have because he had no course of action, because he had no understanding. So we can be a, a resource to other people when they don't know what to do. If we know what to do, then we can give them guy. I can't do it for them. I couldn't pick up that guy, put him on my backpack, and carry him, him to shelter. What I had to do was give him some hope that simply says, listen, let me, let me tell you what to do. This is what we'll do together, and I will lead you, but you're going to have to walk. You're going to have to do it. But yeah, you can come along with me, and we'll get you to a point where you can take it from there. That's what I am, I hope, and that's what you become is a resource to other people when it's really bad. But you cannot carry them because you will both die. If I had to carry that guy, I wouldn't be talking to you. Okay, grandfatherly well, wisdom, I'll stop. That's quite the story. Yeah. Hey, okay, Jim, thank you so much, so much for all of your wisdom and for um, talking to us today. Where can our audience go to find you? 
Well, my website is, website is jimsway.com, J-I-M-S-W-A-Y.com. Uh, there's lots of videos that are published on there that are free that people can watch. I'd also recommend they register for my newsletter, which is called the, the Provident Living Times. I send it out at the beginning of each week. And then Wednesday nights, I do a class uh, on Zoom. It's live. It's free. Uh, so I do a class every Wednesday night. And then on Saturday mornings, I do an open forum Q&A. The link to those, uh, those classes is in my newsletter, so they can come to that, bring people to it. Uh, so that you can, and Saturday is a good place because it's like ask any off the wall question, you know. Now, there are some things that's like, I don't know, and I don't. I, I'll, and now I'll tell people I don't know, but here's what I would do because if you have an understanding, you can always speculate. This is where I would start, but I don't know what the final solution is, but at least I would have a course of action. Uh, the other thing I do, I do have a bunch of things that are published on YouTube, uh, which you have a link on my website that you can find my YouTube there. I have been doing things on Facebook, a bunch of things there. I haven't been doing it because I'm, I'm a one-man show right now, and I'm just busier and heck. I'll get some more things back on YouTube, but there's a whole bunch of things that are uh, archived there on short little classes I've done. And uh, so I'd recommend people do that. I also have a uh, kind of a, it's a member's library. It's a subscription I wanted the price to be very low, so it's $5.99 a month. And then it has some classes in it that are very unique. Uh, there's a sanitation class, which I've been teaching live down in Sterling. I'm just finishing up getting the, the new updated version of the Hidden Deadly Disaster. That's the name of it. Hidden Deadly Disaster. It's four hours on sanitation. It's sanitation principles, not just list of supplies, but principles and concepts. I'm about to add another hour to it to dig a little deeper into some things that I've learned. There's also a five-hour class on water, but it's all about the principles of water. And yes, what you can do, how to use chlorine and some of these things, but it's all about understanding the principles of what you would do and how you might take really bad water and make it clean. And then there's some other classes on there about building community. So I publish some there. I have lots of free classes, but I, it helps to finance some of what I'm trying to do so I can buy things and break them. That's part of what I do is I'll buy some people ask me, how does this work? And I said, well, I don't know. We'll find out. And so what I really want to do is more and more of that, but I have to have some resources to do it. So eh, five ninety nine gives me money. I can buy a survival straw and I can buy a Berkey and things like this. See, one of the things manufacturers will tell you what their products do, which is good, but they're not going to tell you what they don't do. They won't tell you the limits. I push things to the limits, not because it's a bad product, but simply no, and these circumstances it works very well. If you think it'll do this, it won't. It'll get you in trouble. So you need to know the limits. So what I'm trying to do, want to do with resources, I want to become the consumer reports of preparedness products. <laughs> that would what be awesome. Do, what they won't do. So anyway, that's where I'm at. And I I enjoy sharing with people. And usually I try and on an interview, I try not to just dominate it and roll on, but you wound me up, so I went. Anyway, <laughs> ask me questions. I'll try to answer them and keep it short. <laughs> One more thing. I'm. This is a personal request, but I love the law of the parachute. Will you just share that really quickly with us? Okay. It, it's. I have different law ways of looking at things, and there's 16 laws of well-being and success. One of them is it's the law of the parachute. When you think about a parachute, we all know what a parachute does, what it looks like. You know, jump out of a plane with a parachute, pull the ripcord, float down to the earth and not die. That's the whole point of jumping out of a plane is not dying. Or if the plane falls apart and you have to jump out, you want to have a parachute. So here's the law of the parachute for a parachute. You have to have it before you need it. You have to have it with you when you need it. You have to have it on when you need it. You have to actually use it. That's number four. Number five is it has to be of life-saving quality. In other words, if it looks like a parachute, maybe it was a parachute, but now it's all mildewed and rotten. That doesn't do you any good. When you pull the ripcord and it shreds above you, or I was going to get a parachute, but I didn't get to the store, or I couldn't afford a parachute, whatever it is, gravity doesn't care. Gravity doesn't give a rip that you were going to buy a parachute. It's going to do its job, and its job is to suck you to the center of the earth until something gets in the way. We call it the ground. The fall doesn't hurt you. It's just a stop at the bottom that does. Okay, now I'm not Tom. I've never jumped out of a plane. I can't figure out. I'm, I'm a, I was a pilot. I love piloting, but I can't figure out why anybody would want to jump out of a perfectly good plane. But 
in this case, it applies to our provident living or our preparedness. I like to call it provident living. It, it, it's, it, it's, about our, it's about our attitude, our knowledge, our skills, our supplies, which includes all of those nine. And they have to be in place before the emergency because the emergency disaster has no responsibility for your well-being and nobody else does either. It's up to you. So those things need to be in place. That's the law of the parachute that you can ask yourself, am I ready to deal with whatever it is? Thank you so much for sharing all of this wonderful information. We appreciate you spending time with us. This has been amazing, as always. We so much appreciate the massive amount of, of understanding that you're providing and how you can motivate people to set off on doing great things. So the question of the day, what are you doing to embark on a quest that's going to make a difference on you being prepared, resilient, and self-reliant? Comment below. And thanks for being part of the solution.